Hello, this is Dr. Hena Asil, and this is Unit 2 of January 2023. So this was the exam from uh, Pearson Edexcel International AS. Uh, let's take a look at the questions. The first question says, a student measures the entropy change of combustion of methanol using the apparatus show. After burning 0.2 grams of methanol, the temperature of the water increases by 16 degrees Celsius. The measurement uncertainty in the thermometer used in the experiment is 0.5 degrees Celsius for each reading. What is the percentage uncertainty in the temperature change? Remember that temperature change means I measured the initial temperature and the final temperature. That means you use the thermometer twice, so your uncertainty would be 2 times the 0.5 over the reading times 100. This is how we get a percent uncertainty. So this comes out to be 6.3, and my answer is C. The student repeats the experiment but burns 0.3 grams of methanol and uses 75 centimeter cubed of water. What did he use at the beginning? At the beginning, he used 0.2 grams of methanol and I think 50 of water. There was 50 centimeter cubed of water. Now he's using 0.3 grams of the same substance of methanol and he's using more water. What is the expected? Temperature change. Remember, he's not saying what would be the final temperature. What is the expected temperature change? So the temperature of the water should rise by how much? It will rise by the same amount since we're using the same substance. So we're using methanol. The delta T for methanol would be the same, whether I'm using 0.2 grams or 0.3 grams since we are using more water uh, instead of 50, so it would be the same rise in temperature. The student's calculated enthalpy change of combustion of methanol is more exothermic than a data book value. So he got a value higher than what he should get. What is the possible reason for that? Well, let's take a look at the choices. If we have heat loss to the environment, then my value would be lower, not higher. Incomplete combustion also, that would cause a lower um, uh, delta H, not a higher one. Evaporation of methanol would also give a lower exothermic uh, value. If he uses the molar mass of ethanol, then he's using the wrong mass of ethanol and that means he could get more than the expected value. Which equation represents the standard enthalpy change of atomization of bromine? First, let's remember what do we mean by standard enthalpy change of atomization. This is the enthalpy change that takes place when one mole of gaseous atom so I want to form one mole of gaseous atom. So my answer is A or B. From its elements under standard condition. So we're starting from its element. Its element is bromine. What is the standard condition of bromine? Bromine at room temperature under standard conditions, it is a liquid, not a gas. The enthalpy change of reaction for the equation shown can be calculated using bond enthalpy data. The expression that should be used is which one? So if I want to get delta H using bond enthalpies, how do we do that? We determine the bond energy needed or the energy needed to break the bond in reactants minus the energy forms or the energy released when products are formed. So that means I have half HH bond, so I, I need half of the 436, plus I have half CLCL bond, so I need half 242, 
minus the product minus the HCl. So obviously my answer is that first. Which compound has London forces as the only intermolecular force? If you look at the choices, all of them will have London forces between them. But he wants London forces only, nothing else. So if I look at HF, you should realize that this is a polar bond with a polar compound. So this will have dipole-dipole interactions between the molecules in addition to London forces. OF2, this also is polar. It will also have dipole-dipole interactions. PF3 is the same. It's also polar because uh, the directions of the polarities do not cancel each other. Remember, each of these bonds is polar. If they don't cancel each other, then the overall molecule is polar, and it would have dipole-dipole uh, interaction. Now, CF for each of the bonds is polar, but they are in opposite directions, so they cancel each other. So this molecule is actually not polar as a molecule. So the only intermolecular forces between them would be London force. Which compound has intermolecular hydrogen bonding? So I want something that can form hydrogen bonding between the molecules. Well, in order to form hydrogen bonding, first there should be hydrogen attached to an electronegative element. So I'm looking for something that has hydrogen attached to an electronegative element. So A and B, they don't have hydrogens attached to the or uh, bonded to the electronegative element. So A and B are not the answer. So my choices are either C, which is this tertiary alcohol, or D, which is an aldehyde. But you should realize that in the aldehyde, the hydrogen is not attached to an electronegative element. So the only one that will form hydrogen bonding is the alcohol, because alcohols have hydrogen attached to the electronegative oxygen so they will form intermolecular hydrogen bond which sequence shows the hydrogen halides in order of decreasing boiling time okay let's take a look what choices do we have hf you should realize that hf is a polar compound that can form hydrogen bonds between the molecules so this will have strong bonds strong intermolecular forces. So actually, if we're comparing hydrogen halides, the hydrogen fluoride has the highest. So if I'm doing decreasing, I'm starting with HF. So my answer is A or B. Remember that the hydrogen halides, HF, has strong hydrogen bonds between the molecules. So this has the higher uh, boiling temperature. Then, if we look at the other hydrogen halides, now hydrogen chloride, hydrogen bromide, hydrogen iodide, they all have dipoles, but as the halogen uh, atom increases, then the intermolecular forces will become stronger. So actually, out of these three, the HI is the one that is stronger. So HF has higher boiling point. And then the HI is stronger, the HBr is less, and the lowest boiling temperature would be HCl. So this is the order of boiling temperatures for the hydrogen halo. Which ion contains vanadium with an oxidation number of plus 4? You know how to calculate oxidation numbers, is that right? So let's calculate oxidation numbers for each of these. The VO2 plus each oxygen, of course, has an oxidation number of minus 2. So I want the overall to be plus 2, and that means my X is plus 4, or my vanadium is plus 4. So this is actually the answer we're looking for. If we calculate the oxidation numbers for the others, 
then the VO2 with one positive will have a plus five. VO3 with one negative will also be a plus five, and VO4 with three negatives is also plus five. So the only one we're looking for is A. What is the formula of potassium manganate six? So this is the oxidation number of the manganese. I have potassium manganate in which the manganese has plus six. And we know that each oxygen is minus two, so that is minus eight. So the overall is zero. So potassium, all the potassiums that we have, should have an overall of plus two. You know that potassium is in group one. Each potassium must have a plus one, and that means I must have two potassiums in order to have plus two to balance the manganate up. Compound Q produces a red color in a flame test and a white precipitate with potassium sulfate. What is compound Q? Okay, let's take a look first. He's saying red color in flame test. You remember the flame test. You should remember the flame test. Which one gives red color? Well, I actually have two choices. It could be lithium or it could be strontium. So my answer is either A or C. Then he says a white precipitate is formed when the solution reacts with potassium sulfate. And that means if I react it with potassium sulfate, it should form something sulfate that is insoluble. Well, if I have lithium chloride, you should remember that lithium sulfate is soluble. Lithium is a small ion with low charge. Sulfate is larger anion. So this would be easily uh, dissolved in water. So lithium sulfate is aqueous. So strontium uh, sulfate is the one that would not be soluble and would form a white precipitate. So this is my answer. Are we following how to answer all of this? Okay, which reaction produces more than one product? So I have magnesium plus oxygen. What does that give me? It gives magnesium oxide. Of course, we need to balance the equation, but I'm just looking at the products. This will give magnesium oxide. Calcium plus chlorine will give calcium chloride, and that's it. Strontium in water, remember, strontium reacts with cold water. It's a reactive metal. It will react with cold water to form strontium hydroxide plus hydrogen. So this is the one that produces more than one product. Barium oxide plus water, remember oxides plus water will form the hydroxide and that's it. Which equation shows a redox reaction that would not be expected to occur based on the trend in reactivity of the halogens? So which of these is not possible, will not happen? Well, if you look at the halogens, remember, Fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, astatine, the one above is more reactive than the one below. So the one above is the one that will displace the one below it from its salt. So if I say iodine plus something astatide, yes, iodine is more reactive than astatine and it would displace it. So A is possible. Uh, chlorine plus something bromide, notice which one. Chlorine can displace bromine from its salt, so that will happen. Chlorine plus something iodide, chlorine will displace iodine from its salt. Now, fluoride plus something, sorry, um, so this is astatine plus something fluoride. No, astatine will not displace fluorine from its solution because fluorine is more reactive. It cannot be displaced by astatine. A fixed amount of concentrated sulfuric acid is reacted separately with an excess of four solid potassium halides. In which reaction would the greatest number of moles of halide be oxidized? Remember when we react concentrated sulfuric acid with something fluoride, chloride, bromide, iodide. 
With fluoride, it will just react and that's it. With chloride, it will react and form HCl, which is not a good reducing agent. So that's the end of it. But remember that with bromide, I get several products. With iodide, iodide will produce HI and HI is a very good reducing agent. So it will continue to react with the uh, sulfuric acid to give iodine and H2S. So this is the one that gives a uh, more number of moles of halide oxidized. Silver nitrate in aqueous ethanol is added separately to form to four halogenoalkanes, which would form a silver halide precipitate in the shortest time. He's asking which one will react faster. So what do we have? We have iodide, and this is tertiary iodide. Chloride, and that is tertiary. Um, then we have primary iodide and primary chloride. Okay, which of these reacts faster? You should re realize that the tertiary reacts faster than the primary. So our answer is A or B. Then, which one will react faster, the iodide or the chloride? You should remember that iodide would react faster to form a tertiary carbocation, and this will form a silver halide with the uh, silver nitrate solution. This compound is heated with ethanolic potassium hydroxide. How many alkene products are possible? Okay, remember that when we react this compound with uh, potassium hydroxide, alcoholic potassium hydroxide, what we have is dehydrohalogenation or elimination of H and Br. Elimination of the HBr will give an alkene. So we can eliminate the hydrogen from one side or the hydrogen from the other side. So these are the two possible products, but then each of them can actually form an E or a Z. So for each of these products, I have an E and a Z, so that means I have a total of four possible alkene products. Which compound is least likely to have a prominent peak at M over Z43 in its mass spectrum? Well, let's look at the structures. I like to look at the structures and then decide is there a part of it that could give M over Z43? Well, A, yes, that part will give uh, 43. Now, if we look at B, if I choose any part, there is no way it will give 43. It will always give something 44, for example. Now, the others will give a portion that is 43. This one will also give a portion that is 43. So the one least likely to give 43 is B. Which compound has peaks at these um, centimeters to minus one in its IR spectrum? So we're looking for something that has peaks at these positions. Now, let's look at A. A has an amino group. So the amine group gives a peak at around 34.15. And it has a cyanide or a nitril that will give at around 22.50. So this is actually my answer. The others will not. The acid, what does the acid give? The acid will give an uh, carbonyl at 17, 20 something, and an OH at 29, 70 something. And the um, alkynes and alkenes will not give any uh, peaks at these wave numbers. Okay, question 17 says, the distribution of molecular energies for a sample of gas in a sealed container is shown. So this is, of course, a Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. Why does the distribution of energy start at 0, 0? Well, we should know that when we draw this graph, we have to start at 0, 0. This is because 
this is a graph of number of particles that have a specific energy. So what are the number of particles that have zero energy? None. None of the particles will have zero energy. All molecules will have, or all particles, will have some sort of energy. And we said we draw it like this because the, most of them will have around the intermediate energy. So we have to start from zero because all molecules will have some energy. We don't have a molecule that has zero energy. Some of the gas is removed, and then the container is resealed, and the gas is cooled. So he's doing two things. He removed some of the gas, and that means what will happen to the area under the curve? Remember, the area under the curve indicates the total number of molecules present. So if I remove some of the gas, then the area under the curve will decrease. So my answer is B or D. Now, what happens to the peak if he cools it? Remember, if we do at a lower temperature, then the peak will shift to the, to the left. A lower temperature, the peak is on the left. Higher temperature, the peak shifts to the right. Calcium hypochlorite is used for water treatment in swimming pools. It is produced in the reaction between calcium hydroxide and chlorine. State the type of reaction occurring in this equation. Justify your answer using oxidation numbers. So let's take a look at the equation. You can see that chlorine is changing into two products. One of them is going from the zero to plus one. So that is oxidation. And the other one is going from the zero to minus one. So that is reduction. So when a species in the same equation is oxidized and reduced to give two different products, this is called disproportionation reaction. And that means that the oxidation number of chlorine once changes from zero to plus one, and that is oxidation, and once from zero to minus one, and that is reduction. So this is how we explain it. We say the name of the reaction and the justification using oxidation numbers. Calculate the percentage atom economy by mass for the production of this compound. So let's look at this equation. This is the equation we have. How do we calculate percent atom economy? Percent atom economy is the molar mass of the desired product. So here we want CaClO2. This compound over the sum of all the molar masses of all the products times 100. So in this case, what is the molar mass of that first compound that I need? If you calculate it, that comes out to be 143.1. Then calculate the molar mass of each one. Remember, we have two water, so we have to take that into consideration. Now, percent atom economy, this is the total of the products, and the percent atom economy will be the one that I want, which is the 143.1, over everything times 100. So this comes out to be 49.3%. Are we following? A swimming pool has this, these dimensions. The water in the swimming pool has calcium chlorate concentration of 4.2 milligram per decimeter cube. Calculate the mass in kilograms required to treat the water needed to completely fill this swimming pool. So basically, we're looking for the mass in kilogram of this compound. If we have this volume, how do we get the volume? Well, the volume is uh, length times width times height. So multiply all of them, but this is in meter cubed. And usually when we work, we need to work in decimeter cubed. So multiplied by a thousand. So this is the volume in decimeter cubed. And then he gives me a concentration, but the concentration is in mass per decimeter cubed. So I can use that to get the mass. So the mass would be the concentration 
which is 4.2 and this is milligrams so I need to change it to grams so this is 4.2 times 10 to the minus 3 grams times the volume that gives me the uh, mass in grams and he wants it in kilograms so I divide by a thousand so this comes out to be 10.5 kilograms Calculate the volume of chlorine at room temperature and pressure needed to make this mass. So where is the equation that we need to make this compound? This is the equation that he gave. Me. And he wants the volume needed to make that mass that we calculated. So we calculated that the mass is this, 10.5 times 10 to the 3 grams. Now. We can use that to get the number of moles. Number of moles is mass over the molecular mass, which we calculated before also. So this gives me the number of moles of the product. Now he's saying what would be the volume of chlorine. So I look at the equation. I relate the number of moles of chlorine to the number of moles of the chlorate. So here the number of moles of chlorine should be twice that of my product. So this is the number of moles of chlorine that I need. Now he wants to calculate volume. How do we get volume of a gas? Volume of a gas is number of moles times 24. This gives me this volume in decimeter cubed. This question is about alcohols with molecular formula C6H14O. Draw the skeletal formula of each of the three tertiary alcohols with this formula. So he wants six carbons and it's a tertiary alcohol. And he wants skeletal formula. Please follow all his instructions. So I want to draw three different tertiary alcohols that have six carbons. Can you think of how to draw it? So this would be one method of putting my OH so that it's a tertiary alcohol and these are six carbons. This one would be another possibility. So changing the position of the OH but keeping it as a tertiary. This would be a third possibility. So these are the three skeletal formulas of the three tertiary alcohols. Two primary alcohols, A and B, are shown. Give the IUPAC name of alcohol A. Okay, how do we name alcohol A? First of all, we take a look at the longest chain and we start from the side that will give the lower number of the alcohol. So this is how we um, number it. So this is four, so this is a butte and it is a butane one all and it has two methyl groups on carbon number three so the name is 3,3-dimethyl-butane-1-all. one all can we see that explain why alcohol b has higher boiling temperature than alcohol a now what is the difference between alcohol b and alcohol a that alcohol B has less branches. Remember that we said branching makes lower boiling points. Now, this B has less branches, so it's a longer molecule, larger surface area. It will have stronger London forces between the molecules, so more energy will be needed to separate the molecules. So remember that more branching, lower boiling points. Explain why alcohol B is completely soluble in ethanol, but only slightly soluble in water. Well, what kind of forces can we have between alcohol B and ethanol or water? So if he's saying it's more soluble in ethanol, that means that the London forces between B and ethanol are stronger than those in the B molecule. So within the molecule, the London dispersion forces that will be formed in the molecule are um, weaker than the London dispersion forces between B and ethanol. So this will allow it to dissolve completely in ethanol. But it does not allow it to dissolve completely in 
water. Remember that hydrogen bonds between this molecule and water will allow it to dissolve slightly, but the forces between B and water are weaker than those in B. Give the structure of the organic product of each reaction. Let's take a look. So the first one here is an alcohol. It's primary alcohol. And I am putting what? I'm putting an oxidizing agent, potassium dichromate. So this will oxidize the primary alcohol to what? To acid. Remember that primary alcohols are oxidized to acid. Now reaction two has a secondary alcohol. Now when we oxidize a secondary alcohol, it gives a ketone. What about reaction three? Now, reaction 3 has the primary alcohol, but we're reacting it with red phosphorus and iodine. Remember this, what does this reaction do? It removes the OH or it replaces the OH with an iodine. So, this is my product. This question is about the synthesis of propyl amine. So, we're trying to make this compound three roots for synthesis of this compound are shown. So he has this and he's going to ask us about the different steps. So the first question is asking about this first step. Identify by name or formula the reagent used in step X. So what do we have? We have an alkene and we're adding H and Cl. So I'm reacting it with hydrogen chloride, or you could say hydrochloric acid. Give the structure of compound W. What is he doing to get compound W? He's reacting the chloride with a nitril or a cyanide, so that will remove the Cl and put the uh, nitril or the Cn. It should be a C with a triple bond N if we want um, a displayed formula. The reagent used in step Y is potassium azide, so that is something that has N3 minus. This is a source of the azide ion and acts as a nucleophile. Complete a possible dot and cross diagram for N3 minus. Remember, first of all, that when he has a minus, that means he has an extra electron. On this molecule. So this is one possible arrangement for the electrons. Remember nitrogen is in group 5, it needs three electrons. Now the nitrogen on the right is going to share three with the nitrogen in the middle and it has the extra two or the rest of the two that is not used in bonding next to it. The one in the middle will share three with the one on the right and two with the one on the left and remember that the one on the left or one of them has an extra electron so this is the dot and cross for this molecule this compound uh he did step y and he's replacing br with the azide ion so complete the mechanism for step y include curly arrows and any relevant lone pairs and dipoles. So of course, the N3- minus is a nucleophile. It will attack the carbon atom because it is slightly positive and the Br is slightly negative. So the electrons between the C and the Br will go to the Br. So my other product is the Br-. minus. So this is, of course, an SN2 mechanism. Step Z is carried out by reacting ammonia with one bromopropane. Where is step Z? This is step Z. He's reacting ammonia with that compound, one bromopropane. Give the conditions for this reaction. So if I'm reacting the alkyl halide with ammonia, what are the conditions? Ethanol in a sealed tube or under pressure. Suggest so why the yield obtained using step Z is low. Why is it I'm trying to get the primary amine? Can you see that? 
but he's saying the yield of the primary amine will be low. Now, why will it be low? Because it will not stop at the primary. It will probably continue further substitution of the product to form secondary and tertiary amine. The next question says, discuss some aspects of the thermal stability of the anhydrous nitrates of elements in group 1 and 2 of the periodic table. In your answer, you should explain the trend in thermal stability of group 2 nitrates. Describe any differences in the products of thermal decomposition of group 1 nitrates and give equations for the thermal decomposition of sodium nitrate and magnesium nitrate. Remember, the, this is the question with an aesthetic, so you need to explain in detail, um, in uh, a regular order, prop properly, and so on. Okay, so what does he want? We're talking about group 2 nitrates and group 1 nitrates, and you should remember, that group 1 nitrates, when they are heated, they break down to form the nitrite plus oxygen, except lithium nitrate. So this is the difference in products of thermal decomposition of group 1. All of group 1 give nitrite plus oxygen, except the lithium nitrate will give lithium oxide plus nitrogen dioxide plus oxygen. While in group 2, that is also similar to lithium. So magnesium nitrate, for example, would give magnesium oxide plus nitrogen dioxide plus oxygen. Remember, nitrogen dioxide is a brown gas. Okay, so the first part of the explanation would be group 1 nitrates decomposed to give the nitrite and oxygen, except lithium nitrate, which reacts to give the oxide, nitrogen dioxide, and oxygen, and this is similar to group 2. Now, if we look at group 2 nitrates, which one is more thermally stable or less thermally stable? Remember that the ones at the top, the ion, the metal ion is small, so this is more likely to decompose. So magnesium nitrate would decompose more easily than uh, going down the group like barium nitrate. So we need to explain that. You should realize that magnesium nitrate has a small positive uh, metal ion so this has higher charge density magnesium ions will attract the negative charge around the nitrate ion distort the electron cloud make it easier to break up the no bond while going down the group the metal ion is larger so it will have less polarizing power so the nitrate becomes more thermally stable this question says ammonium nitrate is used in the manufacture of fertilizers and explosives. It is produced on a large scale using only methane, water, and air. The process has four stages. The first two reactions in stage one involve the production of hydrogen. At temperature T1, methane reacts with excess steam to give hydrogen. And notice that this is an endothermic reaction with a positive delta H. And then at different temperature T2, the carbon monoxide reacts with more steam, and this also gives hydrogen. So, and this reaction is exothermic with a negative delta H. Give the reason why excess steam is used in the first reaction. Why do we need to add a lot of steam? Of course, this would cause the reaction to go forward it shifts the equilibrium to the right so this gives higher yield of hydrogen notice there are reversible reactions if you add more of the reactant like the steam then the reaction is uh, going forward uh, equilibrium shifts to the right and we get higher yield of hydrogen Predict which of T1 and T2 is higher temperature. Well, where is T1 and T2? T1 is a temperature 
that causes an endothermic reaction to go forward. T2 is a reaction, a temperature that will cause the, react, the exothermic reaction to go forward. Remember that to cause an endothermic reaction to go forward like in T1, then T1 must be a higher temperature. This would cause the reaction to go forward since the forward reaction is endothermic. But if we're looking at the second one, T2, in order to cause the reaction to go forward, I need a lower temperature because the forward is exothermic. Derive the overall equation for production of hydrogen in stage one. How do we get overall equation? These are the two equations he gave me. To get the overall, I need to cancel anything that is the same on both sides and then copy whatever is left on both sides of the arrow. He's saying state symbols are not required, so you don't need to give state symbols. The third reaction in stage one involves removal of carbon dioxide using an aqueous solution of this compound. So just one reason why CO2 is removed. Why do we need something to react with the CO2? We don't want to give the CO2 to the air. Of course, this is because it is a greenhouse gas that leads to global warming, so we don't want it to escape. Name the type of reaction occurring. If we look at this equation on top here, you should know that carbon dioxide is an acidic oxide. It's reacting with something that is an amine. Amines are bases. So acid plus base, this is a neutralization reaction. Draw the displayed formula of this compound. Now, what do we have here? We have CH3N attached to two of these groups. So a displayed formula would look like this. Remember displayed means you show all the bonds and all the atoms. In stage two, the hydrogen from stage one reacts with nitrogen from the air to produce ammonia. And these are the conditions. Give one advantage and one disadvantage of using a high pressure, so using a pressure of 200 atm compared to a pressure of 100 atm. Why is it better to use a higher pressure in this reaction? Of course, this advantage would be the higher pressure shifts the equilibrium to the right to give less number of moles, because this is where we have less number of moles, so a higher pressure will cause it to shift to the right. So this will give me a higher yield of ammonia. And actually another advantage would be a higher pressure increases the rate of the reaction. Now, what about a disadvantage? A disadvantage would be if I need to use high pressure, high pressure requires special equipment. So it is usually more expensive. The reaction in stage two has activation energy plus 70. Notice the numbers. Uncatalyzed between nitrogen and hydrogen has activation energy plus 290. And remember, this was the reaction we were talking about in which the delta H is minus 92 kilojoules. So he's saying complete the profile for the catalyzed and uncatalyzed reaction and label the activation energies and enthalpy change of reaction. And your diagram must match the scale shown for the production of ammonia. So the delta H of this reaction is minus 92. That means going down there, this is uh, each square should be around 50. So that when we draw the energy of activation catalyzed is plus 70 and the uncatalyzed is plus 290. Notice that you have to draw them so that uh, it is the same um, relationship. So the delta H going down, that's uh, minus 92. This is relative to the activation energy that is 70 for the catalyst and plus 290 plus 290 means it has to be up 
uh, all the way up there. So please notice that this is the diagram that we should obtain. Then he says, suggest why the use of the catalyst makes stage two more sustainable. Why is it that using a catalyst in general makes a reaction more sustainable? This is because when we use a catalyst, then we can use lower temperature, so less fuel is needed. In stage three, nitrogen monoxide is produced in the reaction between ammonia and oxygen. The conditions used are a temperature of this in presence of a certain catalyst. Give one reason why a high temperature is needed in this reaction. Why should we use a high temperature? We use a high temperature to increase the rate. But actually, this reaction is exothermic, so I really shouldn't be using a high temperature, but we use a high temperature to increase the rate of the reaction. So just why only a small amount of energy is used to maintain the temperature at 1100. We need to give it only a small amount of energy because it's already releasing heat. The forward reaction is exothermic, so it releases heat. The NO from the first reaction in stage 3 is cooled and then converted to nitrogen dioxide by a reaction with more oxygen. And then nitric acid is produced by addition of water. Explain how adding water in the second reaction affects the yield of NO2 in the first reaction. So if I add water in the second reaction, what is happening? The water is reacting with the NO2 that was formed from the first reaction. So the water removes the nitrogen dioxide as it is being formed. This causes the equilibrium in the first reaction to shift to the right, to give more NO2 to replace what has been used up, and that means it will increase the yield of NO2. Remember he's saying explain and how does it affect the yield. So it will increase the yield because as the NO2 has been Formed, the water reacts with it, so it's as if we're removing the products from the first reaction. This causes it to uh, go forward and give more yield. In stage four, a solution of ammonium nitrate is produced by reacting ammonia with nitric acid. Now he's giving me these data. This is delta H of formation of ammonia, nitric acid, ammonium nitrate, and uh, delta H for uh, changing nitric acid from liquid to aqueous and ammonium nitrate from solid to ammonium nitrate aqueous. Complete the enthalpy cycle. Okay, so let us take a look. What did he give me? This was the table he gave me for delta H of formation of ammonia. So if I'm going nitrogen plus hydrogen plus one and a half oxygen, on the left, he's giving me something that is a total of minus 220.2. Well, if you calculate it, you'll find that that is the total of the delta H formation of ammonia and the delta H formation of nitric acid liquid. Then on the right, we have the formation of ammonium nitrate solid. So that is delta H of formation of ammonium nitrate, which he gives me to be this. And then we're changing ammonium nitrate solid to ammonium nitrate aqueous. That was the other table that he gave me. So that was plus 25.6. So this is the cycle. And he's saying calculate the enthalpy change of that reaction at the top, which is ammonia plus nitric acid to give ammonium nitrate. And we will need to use this uh, enthalpy change cycle. Okay. So looking at the arrows, you can see that all the red arrows going to ammonium nitrate would be equal to the blue arrows on the right. So put that into an equation, calculate for delta HR, we get delta HR is this value. So we add everything on the left in the red arrows, equal everything on the right in the blue arrows and calculate for delta H. Last question, suggest two reasons why it is more profitable to carry out all four stages at the same site 
instead of using different sites for each stage in the industrial production of ammonium nitrate. If we're doing all of these reactions in the same site, well, that will save time, cost of operation, cost of transportation. Uh, also, if all the reactions are after each other, then the energy produced in exothermic reactions can be used in endothermic reactions. And you can actually think of other reasons. Uh, for example, less uh, chemical wastes from the reactions and any other possible reason that uh, could apply. Okay, so that is the end of the paper. Uh, thank you for listening. Please share this and um, hope that it was useful. Thank you for listening.